Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the June 2021 meeting of the Montgomery County Civic Federation. Thank you for joining us. We have an exciting program tonight. Can't wait to get to it. Uh, we're going to start with some basic association business. Um, we've called the meeting to order. And uh, now I need to seek approval of the meeting agenda, which was on page two of the newsletter. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to add five minutes at the tail end of it to talk about updates for Thrive and for attainable housing, if that's OK. I'd prefer not to, but we will have committee reports if there's anybody on the line at the end of our presentation. Is there a motion to accept the agenda? Need a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions? The agenda is approved. Next order of business is to the approval of the May 2021 uh, general meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes that were found on page 31 of the newsletter? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? The May meeting minutes are approved. Thank you, Karen, for doing Next order of business is a treasurer's report. I'm Jerry Garson. Uh, we operate on a fiscal year from July 1, 2020 through this coming June 30th, uh, 2021. Uh, we've had $1,468 of revenue, and we've had expenses of $1,639, giving us a net deficit of $172. And the only expenditures we've had in the last uh, month was the, we paid for the various plaques and engraving of the Star Cup, which cost us $217. Our bank balance is $9,077. Thank you, Jerry. Any if questions? anyone has any questions, let me know. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Couple of brief announcements. First announcement is that the Civic Federation would hold its uh, election for officers in, at its September general meeting, second Monday in September. The other announcement that I have is that uh, there's important public testimony at the County Council on the uh, Thrive 2050 general draft. Um, there have been two dates that have been set aside for testimony uh, this month. Um, I believe the second date is uh, June 29th. So tune in and learn something. Uh, that's it for my announcements. I'd like to get into the program right now since we've got many interesting speakers and uh, Lots of people we'd like to recognize for their outstanding service to the county. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our county council president, Tom Hucker, who is, seems to be in transit for some general opening remarks. Councilman, hey, Council Alan. how are you? Um, We're doing well. I wish I could be there. Pardon me, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Well, I wish I could be there in person with you, of course, but it's always great to be um, at a Civic Federation uh, gala and great to be uh, with um, so many old friends, including the county executive and Delegate Charcutian and Delegate Carr, who I used to sit next to on the House floor and um, Commissioner Patterson, who we just uh, reconfirmed to the board, uh, to the uh, Planning Commission, which is terrific after her great first, uh, first term there. Um, um, I just I wanted to briefly just thank you for all your your hard work. You know we've all come through this incredibly difficult um, year. We for his, by historic standards had to deal with the worst recession in a hundred years since the Great Depression, nearly a hundred, and the worst health crisis since the flu of 1918. And we were dealing with these two huge crises simultaneously and without any kind of operating manual preparing us for that. So it was incredibly difficult, but Montgomery County has come through it um, for a, a lot of reasons. Um, I think you you helped elect rational uh, elected officials, and we've hired a great public health team. But also, 
we have such a great and deep and broad uh, grassroots and civic community that has helped uh, our residents, helped us get the word out, out to our residents to get vaccinated um, and before that to get tested and to wear their masks and to distance and wash their hands and to take all kinds of other precautions despite the inconvenience of them um, that have led us to have some of the best numbers in the country in terms of our um, case positivity um, and uh, other public health metrics. And that, that didn't happen by accident. It's been a real team effort with not just elected officials, but grassroots organizations um, uh, like Civic Federation doing the hard work to get the, to get the word out to people and um, knocking down many of the myths that were out there. So thank you for everything you did to help us keep the community safe um, and get our businesses reopened safely this year. Um, thanks for everything um, that you continue to do um, to give us more rational policy um, and, and uh, have give us more of an engaged and informed uh, citizenry. Um, you all know, I'm, I'm, Alan knows, I've spent a lot of years as a community organizer and I, I really believe in my bones, we make better policy when there's a very informed and engaged citizenry and we hear from them then they know what we're voting on and they know what the implications are um, and, uh, and, and there, there aren't surprises and it's not driven just by special interest. So um, thanks for staying as engaged as you always have for so many decades. Um, we really count on you. You're our eyes and ears. They keep me, I can tell you, stuck in Zoom meetings like this for uh, 10, 12 hours a day. And I, at least, I know all my colleagues too, too, really rely on all your phone calls and your emails and your advice and your guidance to do the Sorry. This name shifted as I was uh, muting somebody. I'm sorry, Tom. You you heard? Did you hear all the rest? Yes, we did. What, what I've been saying. Okay, good. So I was just going to tell you, my my old boss when I first uh, uh, moved here many decades ago for community organizing job. He used to uh, tell the troops I was sending out to go door to door that he wanted to give them a pat on the back and a kick in the butt. And as as inartful as that is. Uh, uh, I, that stuck with me. And so I'm really grateful to you for everything you're doing. And I hope you stay really engaged and informed because we're counting on you to help us make better policy moving forward. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you very much, Tom, for being with us this evening and for your welcoming remarks. Um, on behalf of the Civic Federation, we wanna thank you and your council colleagues for all the hard work you've done keeping us safe and moving forward over the course of this very difficult year. We'd also like to thank Dr. Gales and Dr. Crow and the rest yep. of the healthcare workers, as well as the first responders. It's been a team effort. And I think we emerged from this better than many jurisdictions. So thank you very much, Tom, for being here this evening. Thanks so much for having me. Our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Commissioner Tina Patterson, she's, as Tom says, she's recently been reappointed to her second term on the uh, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and we're glad to have her here. So, uh, Tina, please uh, say something. Good evening, and, and thank you for inviting me this evening and the opportunity to speak. Um, before we get into my actual comments, I, I do want to say good evening to the elected officials here this evening, and a special good evening to my colleague, um, Vice Chair Natalie Fanning Gonzalez. For those of you who have not met me before, as was stated be, um, previously, I'm Tina Patterson, Commissioner with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. In May 2021, as was stated by um, Council Member, Council President Hucker, um, the Council County Council unanimous, unanimously voted um, to reappoint me to the planning board. But I also want to thank the community um, because without you, my reappointment process would not have happened um, for your support of my reappointment, but also your support during the first four years. And I encourage you to be engaged um, with us, with me in the next four years. My comments this evening are mine and not those of the commission nor of the planning board. I want to congratulate all of tonight's award recipients. I recognize that you are volunteers, not paid staff. Your work and the work of your colleagues enriches the planning board, whether it's advocating on behalf of parks, sustainability, or housing. 
engaging with the public is a part of my duties as a planning commission commissioner and I take them seriously. I consider it an honor to serve the residents of this county and I encourage you to keep speaking up and to continue to stay engaged. And with that, again, congratulations to tonight's award recipients. And I'm gonna pass it back to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Commissioner Patterson for, for being with us this evening. We appreciate your representation on the planning board and all the things that you do for the community. Moving into our, further into our program, the next uh, presenter for our Wayne Goldstein Award is Delegate Lori Charkudian from our Legislative District 20 and a good friend of the Civic Federation and neighbors throughout the county. So without further ado, uh, Delegate Charkudian. Well, thank you. Thank you all again for um, echoing the comments that came before me, your um, ongoing work of uh, participating in public policy and processes. And thank you for the opportunity to present this award today. I am so honored actually to be selected to present the Wayne Goldstein Award. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm honored to be presenting it to the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan Coalition. This extraordinary group of organizations. This, this is a, a well-deserved award. And just to put it in context, of course, you know, like as uh, echoing Council uh, President Hawker's comments, it's uh, heartbreaking to be here on, on one more Zoom. Um, but the good news is we're, we're coming out of this pandemic, uh, but it's after a great deal of loss and a great deal of pain. Um, and of course, there's a lot of things that uh, about the pandemic that mirror the climate crisis, the global interconnectedness, the fact that if we're going to solve the problem, we have to solve it in a global way. The fact that everyone is affected, but there's extraordinary inequities in who suffers the most and who dies the quickest from it. Um, but even with those parallels, the pandemic will pale in comparison with the climate catastrophe that's ahead if we don't make radical changes right now. And I think what this coalition has done is they have started at this local level where we have a county that is absolutely committed in practice, in, in concept to making these changes that are needed. Um, and, uh, and this coalition has done an extraordinary job of really um, engaging and connecting and being part of the conversation to make sure that we take those uh, commitments that are there and turn them into action that is actually going to make a difference in the climates and the county's climate impact, um, but also in showing the way for the rest of the country and showing the way for a climate action plan that's grounded in science and reality, in equity, um, and in a comprehensive approach that really considers all of the different ways that we can do this. I can say I worked with a lot of the folks on this coalition in the context of moving the uh, community choice energy bill forward in the General Assembly. So I know uh, the tenacity and the perseverance of these groups. And I can tell you um, that people may or may not have known, but the CCE bill in the General Assembly had come in 15 years ago, 11 years ago, 10 years ago, multiple times and had not get in through, gotten through until we had this set of folks, this coalition working with me um, to get it through the General Assembly. And it's really significant because it does a lot to shift the energy democracy. It does a lot to shift who's in charge of energy decisions out of corporate hands and into the hands of voters and elected officials. So CCE is a piece of the plan. Of course, there's much more to the plan. Um, and, uh, and you all all are have done an incredible job to make sure that plan uh, really uh, meets the challenges that we are facing right now. So I, I feel like I could go on for a while, but I think that we want to hear from the folks who are receiving this award. So I'll just say congratulations, and it's my honor to present you with this award. And I hope that I get to see you soon and give you all hugs in person, vaccinated hugs in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Charkudian. We've got uh, three speakers this evening who will make remarks on behalf of the CAP Coalition. And we'll start with Doris. And Doris, you can introduce the other two guests uh, at the conclusion of your remarks. I will, yes. Before, they, um, before that, I just wanted to thank uh, Delegate Charkudian 
who has been a real climate champion in Annapolis. And you've made it possible for the county to have even a chance at meeting its greenhouse gas reduction goals. And we thank you for your work and we'll be there to support your future efforts on climate. So thank you. And uh, before I go to Rosie and Eleanor to accept the award, I wanted to just give you some background on the coalition and what we're about. So the coalition was created um, pretty recently in November. And uh, our purpose is to really support and advocate for forceful climate action by the county consistent with the 2017 climate emergency resolution. There is still a lot of work to do. We are just beginning. But our, our coalition, uh, coalition's mission is to be an effective advocate for the county to achieve the goals of reducing greenhouse gases by 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2035, restoring a safe climate while creating a sustainable economy with racial and social justice and mobilizing large scale efforts to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Another important role we play is to track the county's efforts and hold it accountable for ensuring that the climate emergency goals are met. So what has the coalition been doing or what are we doing now? We provided comments to the county on its draft climate action plan with the objective of strengthening the county's plan. We are working on proposals for legislative and other action and are looking to partner with council members and the county executive and county um, and council member Tom Hucker. We are knocking on your door and we're working to support the implementation of the community choice energy program, the building buildings energy performance standard legislation and their international green construction code and other county level plans. So um, to put it in context, the climate situation is truly an emergency and we cannot afford only incremental progress. We are reaching critical climate tipping points. These are points of no return. Just last week, for example, NOAA reported that we have reached 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. The last time the planet had these levels was over four, and a half, four to four and a half million years ago, and sea levels were 78 feet higher than they were today. I mean, that boggles the mind. Uh, we're dealing with a global system that must be turned around before 2030 or the results will be uh, cited before catastrophic. We have just nine years to turn us around. You and I, on this Zoom call, are the ones who need to make it happen. So what must we do? We need to talk to our friends, our neighbors, um, the places of work, uh, our families, and begin the conversations about climate change. And don't ever stop. Vote and work to elect people who will lead and take the risk and set the vision and work to turn that vision into concrete action. Continue to advocate for forceful action at the county level, at the state level with partners like Delegate Charcunian and beyond. Um, so thank you very much. And I would like to hand over the acceptance to Rosie, Clemens Cope, who is a Pyle Middle School student, and her sister, Eleanor Clemens Cope, a Richmond Montgomery High School student, as they represent Sunrise Rockville, who is also part of our coalition. So both are really impressive uh, young people. They are fearless and courageous, warriors for change. And I think it's important that we hear from them since their generation is going to hear, is going to bear the, the biggest brunt of our current actions or our failure to act. So I want to turn this over to Rosie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rosie Clemens Cope. And on behalf of the MOCA Climate Action Plan Coalition, we are happy to accept the Wayne Goldstein Award from the MOCA Civic Federation. Like any effective social justice movement, there are a lot of people to thank. I first want to thank um, the young people with Sunrise Rockville, um, especially our friends Sierra Stubbs, Justin Grossman, Zuri Rashad, Sophie Hutter, and Julia Brightman, as well as allies from Sunrise Silver Spring, who put together actions and disruptions and who aren't afraid to demand a better climate action plan. We also want to thank MOCO's BIPOC communities for their climate action work, including a crucial letter that criticized the county cap from an equity standpoint. These could include the Moore Network, Fasa de Maryland, Impact Silver Spring, Muslim Voices Coalition, and activists with these groups, including Kyrie Clark, Tasnuba Khan, Denise Guitara, Valerie Salazar, and Jane Park. 
We think Extinction Rebellion and Jim Driscoll, a tireless partner and champion for the youth. No one is as fierce or as fearless as Jim. We also think our friends from the climate mobilization, Christine Penzich, Dorcas Robinson, yeah. Doris Gwen, Carl Held, Herb Simmons with his research and policy knowledge, the tireless Nancy Wilkinson, and Bailey Conjay for his expertise. Next, we thank Mo um, uh, 350 MoCo and our friend Jeff Weissner for his work on the CAP and beyond. We also thank the County Council candidate Brandi Brooks for her work envisioning a County Green New Deal. And last but not least, we thank the whole MoCo Faith Action for Climate Solutions team, especially our friend Walter Weiss. The CAP Coalition is deeply honored to accept this award. It takes incredible energy and commitment to move policy to meet the moment and address the climate crisis. We've brought our concern to elected officials many times in conference rooms, on Zoom, and in the CAP's natural habitat, on the streets. This is what democracy looks like. And our partners chose my sister and me to speak today because we need to bring you an important message from the youth. The county's plans are nowhere near what scientists say they need to be to save the planet from the climate crisis. It's nowhere near what we, think that, uh, what we think that the county needs to do. We are calling on MoCo residents of all ages and organizations in communities and schools to join us. Join one of the CAP groups pushing for a county Green New Deal. We need more of our friends and neighbors in MoCo to recognize that we are standing at the edge of a cliff. If we don't act more boldly, MoCo Mo children will have far fewer opportunities than their parents had. Our county is one of the most privileged places on earth. If our county can't figure out a way to take more aggressive action on climate, then what hope is there for the rest of the globe? Solidarity is our greatest strength. Our power is growing and we will stop the climate crisis together. It's time to wake up and stand up for our earth. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. And I am Eleanor clemens -Cope. And again, thank you to every person Rosie mentioned and everybody else who has worked to push Montgomery County to do better on climate. Despite the noise we've made, the county is still mostly dragging their feet on the climate crisis, doing just a little and endangering their young people and frontline communities by not doing enough. Going forward, the youth and many allies in the MoCo Climate Action Plan Coalition are transforming into the MoCo Green New Deal Coalition, moving from demanding a better climate plan to demanding real climate policy. A county Green New Deal means climate, jobs, and justice for every member of our community. This means that we reach net zero emissions by 2035 to protect our youth and our frontline communities from devastation in the decades to come. It means that we electrify and retrofit all buildings. It means that we implement the renewable energy programs we can and lobby the state for even better ones. And as we transition away from fossil fuels, the Green New Deal we envision for our county will transition workers to good paying union jobs. It will honor farmers in their land as we look for places to site renewable energy projects. We will protect MoCo's ecology, renew our tree cover, secure green space, clean air, and clean water for all. We will expand the green public transportation system with free fare. Our movement goes hand in hand with other MoCo social justice movements, like those working to remove armed cops from high schools and prioritizing funding for behavioral health. That's what a Green New Deal in Montgomery County looks like. This takes dedicated funding and dedicated staff in county government. And with this vision, we demand that our politicians step up. It's time to secure climate, jobs, and justice for all. We are not backing down. We are only getting started. We are fighting for our lives and we're sticking together. And together, we will change the world. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Eleanor, for those inspirational words. We're so glad you could be with us this evening and congratulations to the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan Coalition on receipt of the Wayne Goldstein Award. Wayne Goldstein was a good friend to many of us and he believes strongly in the ideas of sustainability and conservation and uh, activism 
and uh, your words uh, remind us of uh, his great contribution to the county. So thank you, uh, thank you so much. There is a plaque and we'll get it to you uh, shortly. It's easier now that we're beginning to uh, reopen. Our next uh, presentation is the presentation of the Sentinel Wars. Now, typically the Civic Federation um, makes one presentation for the Sentinel Award, but this year there are two groups that really stood shoulders, head and shoulders above others in terms of their collaborative uh, work and their adv advocacy. The uh, Friendship uh, Citizens Coordinating Committee on Friendship Heights and the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition. And we've asked uh, County Executive Mark Elrich, who's on the call, to um, to make some introductory remarks uh, leading to the presentation, the virtual presentation of the Sentinel Awards to these two outstanding groups. Uh, County Executive Elrich, there you are. And you are muted, Mr. County Executive. There am, I, am I unmuted now? You Good. are. Okay, let me get my stuff back up here. Hang on a second. You know how it is when you move from one thing to another and then those things disappear in the process of what you're doing. So I okay, got it back. So look, um, first of all, I wanna say I'm, I'm honored uh, to have been asked to present the Sentinel Award tonight and especially happy to give this to the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition and to the Citizens Coordinating Committee of Friendship Heights. Your work on the proposed 2050 plan is badly needed and I share many of the concerns that you have raised. Revising the general plan is a complex process and will affect many communities in Montgomery County. And I've been concerned that the planning department is um, undertaking this broad rezoning of the county in the midst of a pandemic, which has not only impaired people's abilities to gather, meet and discuss, but more importantly, has taken place at a time when people's minds have largely been preoccupied by the pandemic and its effect in our lives and the in our communities. I have talked to so many people who I generally think of as you know pretty aware people, and they have no idea uh, what's being discussed and what's being planned. And that should not be the case when you're talking about rezoning you know, much of the county. There's nothing essential in this plan that couldn't have waited until the pandemic was over and we could resume our lives. And yet here we are, the community deserved, I believe, a more open and inclusive process. So much of your collective critique is echoed in our own comments on the plan. The infrastructure needs of this plan aren't addressed. The impact on existing master plans, many of which reflected a growth process that consolidated services, transportation, business and residents and activity centers. We'll see the growth drawn off to areas outside these activity centers and areas without the infrastructure needed to support it. And it will hinder the build out of the centers that we've already master planned. This master plan, this plan does nothing to address the almost exclusively high rise, high priced housing planned for metro centers and does not address the need for diverse housing types and pricing there, and instead seeks to distract attention away from the centers. It's an odd approach to take no responsibility for the land whose development we actually control and instead focus on how to redevelop neighborhoods where innumerable residents would have to make individual decisions to convert their housing voluntarily. So if voluntary doesn't, conversion doesn't happen, then this plan doesn't happen. That's an odd way of doing planning. If planning can't supply diverse housing types and pricing in our centers, then where can we, where we can actually require it? Then how is this gonna happen in neighborhoods? As some of you have pointed out, it actually won't. When I talk to people about missing middle housing, they assume it's about a price point below the high price departments and condos that are being built in the county so that it would be affordable. And in fact, that's how it was originally described. But now, as you point out, missing middle is just a group of housing types with no connection to the need to build additional affordable housing. And while there are principles in missing middle that require compatibility and a walk shed that corresponds to a half mile walk to a center, the rules for this version of Missing Middle require none of that. Your role in educating people in our community is essential now. The work you've done is really important. You've put the plan in the long-term context. You've raised issues about the cost of implementation, and you've raised the fundamental issue about 
whether we would be more or less inclusive were this plan to be implemented as is currently drafted. At the same time, you've made it clear that you recognize the support the need, the need for more affordable housing throughout the county. Not as we've done in the past in certain enclaves of the county, but it needs to be broadly distributed. We need a plan that addresses affordability and we need a plan that includes affordability and diversity in places where most of the future development is already planned. The silence on affordability and diversity in this planning document is deafening, but you are breaking that silence. I applaud your work. I look forward to working with you as we address this plan. It is really important that we get this right. You know, we only do these general plan reviews. Um, we're like half a century beyond the last one. And if this is going to guide us to the future, we've got to make sure that the future that it guides us to is better than the present that we've landed in today, where diversity is not widely present in the county and where we continue to build exclusive communities uh, while we talk about diversity. You know, there, I don't know if many of you realize this, but in Bethesda, um, we can't even achieve some of our affordable housing goals with MPDUs because people have been allowed to build apartments where the condo fees for pools and rec rooms and all these things are so high that we can't even get our affordable MPDU units into these buildings. So the idea that we're building essentially gated communities at the same time we're talking about the need for diversity is a bit detached. Your work, I think, is going to help connect these things together. Um, and I'm really glad that I can be giving you this award tonight. And I just want to say to the previous group, getting the Wayne Goldstein Award is no small thing. Um, Wayne was a real champion of community involvement. And, uh, you know, you, you all should be really honored to be getting an award named, and named for Wayne because I could not think of a finer person I ever worked with at a community level, anybody who was more committed to social justice and equity than Wayne was. So take the reward in that spirit. Thank you. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, before you came on the call, uh, on behalf of the Civic Federation, we wanted to express our thanks for your leadership during the pandemic. And to note for everybody who may not know that you've been a good friend of the Civic Federation and neighborhood for many, many years. So we're glad to have you here. And uh, thank you for presenting the Sentinel Award to the Citizens Coordinating Committee on Friendship Heights and the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition. And to accept the award on behalf of the Citizens Coordinating Committee for Friendship Heights is their chair, David Foreman. David, are you on the line? I, I am. I'm David Foreman, and I'm the chair of the Citizens Coordinating Committee on Friendship Heights. We're a coalition of 21 neighborhood organizations, and we've been around for quite a while. This year is our 50th anniversary. We were formed in 1971 to oppose unworkable overdevelopment at Friendship Heights. While we've continued to fight threats to the Friendship Heights area and have kept Friendship Heights in our name, our interests long ago expanded to land use issues throughout Montgomery County. Obviously, today, the most important land use issues for the entire county are those in the Thrive Montgomery 2050 plan. It is fitting that the Sentinel Award today is being presented by County Exec Executive Mark Elrich because we independently reached many of the same questions and objections that he has voiced in his letters to the County Council. From the beginning, we were concerned with the timing and process by which the Thrive Montgomery 2050 plan was being developed without ad adequate public input. We are especially concerned about the zoning initiative that would allow builders to build multiple family homes in neighborhoods zoned for single family homes. The resulting expensive duplexes and triplexes, so-called attainable housing, would be built by right without the protections of the normal zoning processes. We also have some doubts about the so-called complete communities or 15 minute living concept, which plays a major role in the Thrive Plan. 
It is an idea that might work in Paris, France, where it originated, but it is debatable as a general organizing principle for our large and diverse county. And we're concerned about the absence of specific plans and of funding for the important stated goals of business development, transportation, and the environment. You're giving this award to us and to the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition recognizes the importance of the Thrive Plan for all Montgomery County residents and the need for public input, debate, and revision. We are profoundly grateful for this award. Thank you very much, uh, David. We appreciate your remarks and congratulations to everybody in the Citizens Coordinating Committee. Our, we're also giving the Sentinel Award to the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition. And we have several speakers who are going to speak on behalf of the coalition. Um, first on my list is uh, the mayor of Kensington, Tracy Furman. Um, Tracy, are you there? I am, Alan, thank you. Um, before I say my few words, I, I, I wanna thank the county executive for the letter that you sent to the uh, county council. It says a lot and um, I, you're, you're way smarter than I am, so I, I'm not going to go through your letter, but um, I, just, I think it's so easy for people when you are, you stand up like this, you can be called a NIMBY and that is not, that is the furthest from the truth. There are some real issues with Thrive 2050 that needs to be worked out. And the complexity of these zoning tax amendments is just um, uh, just needs to be rethought. So I, I thank you for the for the letter. It was um, uh, really said everything that, that we've been trying to get across to um, our elected officials. So thank you for that. Um, it is truly an honor to be awarded with the uh, along with the Woodside Civic Association and the Saratoga Village neighbors and the town of Chevy Chase whose leadership was the real driving force uh, behind the coalition. I'd also like to recognize the other 22 communities that are also part of the, co uh, the coalition and the impact that this group has had so far. I am in awe of the engagement and the expertise this group has brought to the table. The coalition has spent a great amount of time meeting with elected officials, housing advocates and planning experts research complex rezoning proposal, ask thoughtful questions, written letters, and signed up to testify. This is Civic Engagement 101. Having the Montgomery County Civic Federation recognize us this evening with the Sentinel Award for our efforts is truly a great honor. As an elected official, never forget to listen to uh, never forget to listen to the villagers because it does take a village to make a community and the villagers are when they're organized are a force to be reckoned with so thank you again for this uh, recognition very much appreciated thank you so much mayor uh, next person to speak would be a vice mayor of town of chevy chase irene lane irene are you on the call I am, and I apologize that I'm in a rather noisy place and a dark place at that, so that's why I couldn't be on video. But um, thank you so much, County Executive Elrich, for your support and good words about our civic engagement group. Uh, thank you to the Sentinel and to Montgomery County Civic Federation for this special recognition. And thank you, Council President Hucker, Commissioner Patterson, and Delegates Charcutian and Carr for taking the time out of your busy schedules this evening to acknowledge the many leaders who are working hard to make our collective community exceptional. I think it's safe to say that none of us do this important work with the expectation of getting an award or an accolade. Rather, we aim to help the county, a county in which we love to work and start small businesses, live and care for our neighbors, and help our children grow into responsible global citizens. Listening to diverse resident voices helps us achieve these goals. And it's important, um, just as it's important in finding common ground. And while it's so easy these days to feel overwhelmed given the complex issues, not only of the last year, but the complex issues of our time and not get involved, connecting with our neighbors and each other, we feel is always better. Our coalition started up less than one year ago with just a few neighbors and friends getting together over Zoom to talk about the promise of Thrive, 
to better understand each other's concerns and to help to help make the county thrive, uh, given the myriad of social, economic, and environmental problems facing us all. I apologize for the background noise. Um, the best way we feel we could do this was by gathering information from our residents, many of whom are economists, transportation experts, environmental advocates, and longtime residents, researching best practices, asking thoughtful questions, and suggesting pragmatic and equitable solutions. Our coalition of 26 communities and counting uh, across the county don't always agree, but we have worked closely together in the spirit of community good, practical outcomes, and common ground. We hope County Executive Elrich and Council President Hucker, that you can both join us for future meetings so that we can share our common vision and goals, as well as share with you our common ideas and recommendations for making our county thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor Irene Lane from town of Chevy Chase. Our next speaker is Bill Scanlon, the president of the Woodside Civic Association Bill, are you on the line? I am, Alan, thank you. And thanks to uh, County Executive uh, Elrich for the presentation. And thanks for inviting us to speak for the Thrive 2050 Coalition. I'm speaking on, on behalf of the Woodside Civic Association. We're uh, proud to be a member of the Thrive Coalition and grateful that the Civic Federation chose us for this recognition and honor. Um, I can honestly tell you that Woodside felt somewhat blindsided in June 2020 by the news that the planning board was considering a plan to annex part of our neighborhood for zoning changes that could have a drastic impact on the density, infrastructure, tree canopy, and character of nearly one third of our neighborhood. Like everything else, COVID initially made it tougher to communicate, to organize, to speak with lawmakers, to speak with planners and staff and understand what was going on. but Technology soon provided a way for us to connect, but I'm, I'm not really exactly sure how we initially connected with the, um, with the Thrive Coalition. Um, but soon enough, we were on, on their regular Zoom meetings and it's been an important part of our ability to hear from other towns and villages, associations, to hear from officials, to show other communities how Woodside is responding to the zoning challenge and to think beyond the broader issue to beyond that to the broader issues proposed by um, Thrive 2050. So to other communities, it may seem like Woodside's efforts to fight the Silver Spring downtown and adjacent communities plan may serve as the proverbial canary in the zoning coal mine, but I'm hopeful that through the Thrive Coalition and other neighborhoods also starting to engage on the potential for serious zoning changes in many of those communities, real solutions could come forward on more affordable housing and attainable housing throughout Montgomery County. Woodside has been doing just that, offering solution, offering up solutions right here in our neighborhood. Like Woodside, I think most Thrive Coalition communities would rather be viewed as allies than adversaries in the housing and zoning decisions ahead. I'm grateful for the work of Irene Dunn and her colleagues and all the others who spearheaded the Thrive Coalition's founding. I'm pleased to see their work recognized tonight by the Civic Federation. It's my sincere hope that the outcome of the planning board and council deliberations on Thrive 2050 will be substantially improved by the Thrive Coalition's efforts. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Bill. The last speaker accepting on behalf of the Thrive 2050 neighborhood Coalition is uh, Elizabeth Joyce representing the Saratoga Village Neighbors. Elizabeth, are you here? I am, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, County Executive Elric. I share my friend's admiration and gratitude for your wonderful letter on Thrive 2050, which was comprehensive in its scope, beautifully written and well-researched. And it gives a perspective that we haven't had before. Uh, good evening also to my council member, uh, President, Tom Hucker, my delegate 20 uh, delegate, uh, Laura Sharkudian, a delegate Carr and Commissioner Patterson. Thank you for supporting this wonderful event. We are so grateful to Alan and the Civic Federation and the Sentinel for this award to our civic associations. And we are honored to be among the talented activists represented here tonight. 
Our group, Saratoga Village Neighbors from East Silver Spring, formed during the past year to study and better understand the rapidly changing political, economic, and environmental challenges to our neighborhood at this crucial time. Like our nation, Montgomery County stands at a crossroads where decisions made by our leaders will powerfully and permanently shape the future. We are very proud to live in one of the most densely populated and ethnically diverse areas of the county. Like so many of our neighbors, we have strong convictions about what will help both our neighborhoods and our county thrive. We hope to serve as partners in expanding the promise and well being of our entire community, east, west, north, and south, present, and future. Montgomery County has a long history of civic engagement and it has yielded impressive results. When citizens contribute their knowledge, skills, and lived experience to making public policy better government results. Greater buy-in, broader trust, and more creative solutions to complex problems can emerge when informed citizens have a place at the table. We hope that County Executive Elric and the Council will meet and work with all of us to hear our vision thoughts and hopes for our great county. Together we can chart a clear path to a brighter future for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and to the, the mayor, the vice mayor, and to Bill for your remarks and congratulations on receiving the, the Sentinel Award. There is a plaque and I'll make sure that somebody gets it. So it'll be in your custody and not in mine. Uh, moving on, our last presentation for the evening is the presentation of the Star Cup, and we are honored to have with us uh, Delegate Al Carr, a friend of the Federation, a friend of ours, who will make the presentation of the Star Cup to uh, this year's awardee, Delegate Carr. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I, it is such an honor to be invited to present the Star Cup tonight. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, the, so the gentleman we are presenting this award to is uh, Lewis Willen. I have known Lewis for 15 years, so longer than I've been a, a delegate, and uh, worked with him on a number of uh, projects. Um, the, the, I think the culmination of his most recent body of work was House Bill 158. This was a bill that uh, just passed the General Assembly in the 2021 session. It, it has to do with the homeowner's property tax credit. This is a program that benefits many, many uh, deserving homeowners of moderate income across Montgomery County and across the entire state. And when Lewis realized that the agency that administers this tax credit was improperly subtracting unrelated tax credits, resulting in citizens being shortchanged by hundreds or even thousands of dollars, he went into action. Uh, so he worked with me several years ago on a bill to try to correct the problem, and his amazing persistence uh, resulted in where we are today to getting House Bill 158 passed through the General Assembly this year. So Lewis is somebody whose tremendous uh, intellect, his, his passion, his innate sense of justice and wanting to fix some of these uh, government systems and agencies and programs that are broken uh, are just amazing. Uh, so uh, Lewis's work has benefited so many people across the state of Maryland, and uh, I think it is so wonderful that you have uh, recognized him tonight by awarding him the Star Cup. It is very much deserved. So congratulations, Lewis. Lewis? Hey, th thank you, Delga Carr, and everyone. Um, I'm not really... Uh, 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 much of a speaker, especially compared to the others. I'm kind of, kind of uh, usually more at home, like uh, reading the tax code okay, for, for recreation. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, th thanks, Doug Carr, especially for, for uh, listening to me when I was 
you know, explaining the issue. And when, uh, you know, even though my claim sounded crazy, you know, and, uh, but you, you were willing to listen and uh, you understood the problem and uh, you hung in with me for, uh, for several years, you know, uh, trying and then trying again until uh, uh, the, the uh, well, the, the state the office of legislative audits finally came through and said, hey, my claims were right. And uh, then, of course, that led to you sponsoring another bill. And, and uh, ultimately, uh, now, now the, the refunds are, are in, the pro in, prog in, in, the, uh, in progress of being issued, I understand, or will be issued by the end of the year. So th thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, I, I guess I just have to say to, to the other award winners, uh, um, you know, just don't ever give up on what you know is right. So thank you. Thank you and congratulations, uh, Lewis. Um, when we spoke, uh, what was it, the day before yesterday, the day before yesterday, um, you said that uh, there might be more than $20 million in refunds coming back to uh, homeowners in Baltimore City and Montgomery County. So it's an incredible thing that you've done for all of us. So thank you. So don't give up and find something else because you know there's there's something else out there that needs uh, the light of the light of day. So that brings us to the end of the awards program of the um, June meeting, like the gallery view. I wanna thank before they leave our elected officials and appointees who uh, joined us this evening, council president uh, Tom Hucker, county executive Mark Elridge, delegates Laurie Trakudian and uh, Al Carr and uh, um, MNC PPC Commissioner uh, Tina Patterson. I want to thank all of our awardees. There are plaques that will be coming your way. The uh, Montgomery County Climate Action Plan Coalition, the Thrive 2050 Neighborhood Coalition, and the Citizens Coordinating Committee on Friendship Heights. The Civic Federation makes these awards every year. We have a process where you can nominate your neighbors for the good work that they do in the community. And we hope that over the course of the year that you will send us nominations for next year's honorees, as well as for Community Heroes, which is an award that we extend to people on a monthly basis at our general meeting. Um, all of this is important to highlight the important contributions that our neighbors make on behalf of the rest of the community. That's it for our awards to program this evening. Some of us will be staying here to uh, talk uh, some Federation business. If you would like to join us, uh, please uh, please log on, I mean, stay on. And uh, if not, we hope to see you. County reopens at an event, um, a function around, uh, around, the, uh, around the county. Again, to everybody who's participated and uh, we will move into the, let me make an announcement well, before too many people leave. The Montgomery County Redistricting Commission has asked for, has invited us to uh, a presentation that they would like to make to the community. And they're suggesting the second Monday in July. We will set up a, we will set up a Zoom. Well, we will set up a Zoom. Um, Dean Ahmad, are you there? Dean, can you hear us? Dean Ahmad, who used to be, who used to, was a president of the Civic Fed, is on the redistricting commission, and I got an invitation from him. I just submitted our money. Uh, Dean, would you like to say something about the invitation about the redistricting commission? There you go. Uh, yes, thank you, Helen. Um, <clears throat> um, sorry for being here late. Um, the um, the redistricting commission, as I think everyone knows, is uh, charged with not only adjusting the uh, uh, election districts for the new census, but also to redefine them so that we increase the number of council manic districts from five to seven. Um, and uh, we are very interested in getting the input. Uh, well, first off, we're very interested in being transparent and making sure that everyone understands what we're doing. And then we'd also like to be able to get 
uh, the input back from organizations like the Civic Federation and its constituents and indeed any interest group in the, the county that would have an interest in this. So what we want to do is we want to have um, virtual meetings uh, with groups like the Civic Fed in which two or three members of the commission would give a presentation about how we're going about the job and then to listen to concerns that we could take back to the uh, to the full commission. Um, so uh, that that's that's it. And uh, what I was hoping was that uh, by presenting this tonight, we could get some kind of a feedback because I know there are no uh, Civic Fed meetings planned for the summer. And obviously we have to get this done by the end of the summer. Uh, so if we could get maybe a virtual um, online meeting uh, to which anyone who uh, is a, a member of this organization or any constituent groups would like to participate, to hear what we're doing, and then to uh, speak up on any concerns you might have. That, that's the bottom line. Dean, before you signed on, uh, we made a commitment to try to do a virtual presentation on the second Monday until long for your suggestion. And uh, if people can't participate, it will be recorded. So we'll be able to share it with our members afterwards. So thank you for uh, joining this conversation and telling us a little bit about your work, which is very important. Where are we gonna get two more councilmatic districts? Uh, we're waiting with bated breath to see what that's going to be. So thank you so much. Alan? Yes. Uh, suggestion. If Dean could provide the information about the date and time of the meeting and a Zoom link when the time is appropriate to um, our secretary, that should go on to our website. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Once, once what, I, what I was going to do is let uh, Alan uh, speak directly to the people who are doing the scheduling. Uh, and let them know when is uh, the best time. It sounds like you've agreed to the proposal I made. Uh, if so, once there is a link, uh, we will get it. I will see that uh, uh, that it gets distributed. Thank you, Dean, and thank you for the suggestion, Peggy. Yeah, I'll be setting it up for the second Monday in uh, July. And uh, for those of you who are not at the beach, well, you could watch at the beach. But those of you who want to watch it on a Monday in July, uh, we will make that available uh, to you. Um, Joe, awkward. Did you want to speak on this issue or something else? I was going to move on oh, this one, if I could. Uh, just a quick question. Sure. Just okay. So I was just curious on the timeline for the districts. When do they have to be completed and and forwarded? Just to, the, just in terms of the timing. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that uh, we'll discuss at length. It's sure. A okay. challenge because we have to submit our report in, I believe it's in September, and right. we don't yet have the census data. So <laughs> what we're right. doing is we're playing around using the most recent available figures <clears throat> to try to get rough drafts that we can discuss and see if we're able to meet the various criteria for fairness that have been laid out. And then when we get the official census data, there'll be a rush to try to get you know, final legitimate borders. Okay, right. And try to use like natural borders and things like that or appropriate borders. Yeah, to, to, I mean, to, to, to not split up, uh, you know, uh, existing uh, um, interest, uh, you know, uh, like civic, civic organizations uh, to not divide them between the districts uh, right. to try to um, uh, let... Um, a mixture of uh, um, of ethnic and racial blends, so that nobody is being, you know, shut out completely from getting mm -hmm. a representative. Of course. Um, trying to uh, well, there's a list actually that's been distributed, okay. and I don't have it in front of me. But oh, if good. you're interested, uh, I could uh, send a report uh, to the newsletter uh, summarizing what's on that list of, of consideration. That'd be great if, if you're open to that for the newsletter. Thank you. That's a great synopsis. I'm good, Alan. Thank you. Alan, I want to make an announcement. Our, our next scheduled meeting, which will be uh, the second Monday in September, will be a, both an in-person meeting in the executive office building and a Zoom meeting for those who want to operate via Zoom. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for that. 
I'm going to I'm going to advise uh, Commissioner Fanny Gonzalez and Patterson that we're going to have a conversation about housing policy. So if you want to absent yourself from this conversation, uh, maybe that would be in your best interest. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. I but I look forward to your testimony in front of Park and Planning for the tenable housing effort. Uh, thank you so much for having us today. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Patterson used to call. Well, then, good. I think that there are some people who wanted to talk about housing policy. It's one of the few, so probably the last opportunity we have before the September meeting. At the September meeting, in addition to election for new officers, I plan to introduce a resolution on behalf of the Civic Federation about uh, the attainable housing issues that are before the planning board and for the county council. We haven't taken a position on that yet. We have passed a couple of resolutions about the, the process and the timing, but we haven't talked about the uh, the the details of the policy and I know that there's lot there's lots of interest. I know there's some people who want to speak about that this is about this evening, about that this evening. So I know that uh, Carrie Lamara, you had some remarks and I hope you'll keep them brief. Primarily I wanted to make sure that everyone uh, knew the dates uh, for these these here public hearings. You've got uh, the first county council public hearing, Thrive, June 17th. Second uh, would be June 29th, both at seven o'clock, and the planning board on attainable housing on uh, June 24th. Now, we are the largest umbrella civic organization in the county. It's uh, incumbent upon us to, to participate, do what we can, and uh, get the word out to as many people as possible. If you're gonna if you're gonna provide testimony, get it in there so that uh, you're heard. Whether you support it, whether you oppose it, let's just do the job. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Carrie. I'll, as I mentioned before, I'll be testifying on behalf of the federation at the June seventeenth county council public hearing, and I've signed up for the attainable housing policy. Uh, session that the planning board is going to have on uh, June 24th. So people want to provide input into that. We're going to set up a process over the summer where we'll get together by Zoom to sort of uh, crystallize our position for presentation to the county council on uh, next fall. Um, we have a number of uh, committees. I don't see some of our chairs on. Does anybody, our first committee that we would usually hear report, report from is the Environment Committee. Does anybody have an, any environmental news they'd like to share with the collective? I'll just mention that next year, the one bill that we didn't get a chance to focus our attention on is a bottle deposit bill. For those of us who spend a lot of time out in the great outdoors in the stream valleys, in creeks, you'll notice that there is a, an absolutely outrageous number of plastic bottles which have found their way into the, you know, in, throughout the watershed. So we're going to be supporting legislation to have a bottle deposit um, provision for the state of Maryland. Anybody? Yeah, else? I've got a couple of things, but Peggy, you can go first. Oh, I would say we would be joining a number of state, other states that have been doing this for years. The difference would be that the states that put the bottle deposit uh, law into effect back in the 1970s are mostly the deposit is five cents a bottle. I think given inflation, we could easily look for a 10 cent bottle as a real incentive for people to take their bottles and recycle them properly in order to get their deposits back. It works in other states. It can work here in Maryland. It really helps with roadside clutter. Thank you for that comment, Peggy, and we'll, we'll spend some time looking at uh, that. Anything else on the environment? Bailey? Yes, a couple of things. Uh, NOAA reported that uh, we've now risen to 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. 
that is a really bad milestone. Things are, we so the uh, climate action plan of the county is even more imperative today and action is very necessary. Uh, with synthetic turf, with climate uh, moving in the wrong direction and CO2 emissions rising, there's no need to add additional greenhouse gases to the mix and synthetic turf is a poster child for all of the things that are wrong with how, how we move our policy in the right direction. So we should keep the pressure on with synthetic turf to get it banned. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you so much. Any bit else on the environment? Now let's move to uh, education. Anybody have any comments they'd like to make about education in the county? A lot of this information we share on the uh, Facebook page where we uh, cut and paste articles from uh, local peri periodicals about issues of concern. Um, we did one on the budget. We did one on transportation. We've done um, lots of coverage on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, transportation, Jerry, would like to say something about transportation briefly. I just want to make one comment on transportation that's sort of a little complex. Uh, Montgomery County has now reached the point that 74.6% of the population over age 12 has been back, uh, fully vaccinated and 77.8% of the population over 18 has been fully vaccinated. We are the uh, law, uh, most successful county, large county or medium-sized county in the country on the percentage of people who have been vaccinated. Therefore, traffic has been resuming. Uh, we now see basically almost every afternoon your, the traffic is backing up northbound on 270, starting basically at 370. Uh, we also see the American Region Bridge being backed up both morning and afternoon. And we see the eastbound uh, uh, traffic on 495 uh, basically backing up every afternoon. One of the things we've noticed is that the morning traffic is not quite as heavy, uh, basically statewide, nationwide, but a lot of people are coming back at later hours. We now see the county uh, is now listening to us on asking for free ride on service, which they're still providing. And there's all kinds of discussions on this, on the regional level of providing various discounts and reducing the fares to basically a maximum of $2 on weekends on uh, Wamata Rail. That's it for me. Thank you, Jerry. Ask their questions. A couple of things. So everybody knows that the state of Maryland is proceeding at pace with the replacement of the American Legion Bridge and the construction of HOV lanes up to 370. There was a pretty sizable demonstration against um, the toll lanes in particular. Uh, in Rockville a couple of days ago. So thanks to the advocates who are speaking out for uh, less roads and uh, more, more transit. Um, some of our friends who have come before the Civic Federation have been, uh, are excited to announce that their advocacy has led to lane separated bike lanes on University um, Boulevard between uh, University Boulevard and uh, Wayne Avenue and Arcola. Anyhow, they were able to persuade SHA to uh, engage in this experiment, and those lanes should be open on Saturday. So, thank the Open the Open Open Roads Coalition and uh, Allison Gillespie and Peter Helms and the people who Christy Daphnis who have been really strong advocates for more uh, uh, protected bike lanes and for more pedestrian safety. Actually, the lanes are already marked and the, the barriers are already up on the eastbound side as of today. And I understand that Allison Gillespie was riding in them and they're not even open yet though because she just could not wait. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, that was one of our priorities during this year of the, the Civic Fed is more attention to uh, pedestrian safety because even the pandemic there was an 
uh, unconscionable loss of lives by pedestrians on the streets of um, and highways of Montgomery County. So we'll continue to work on that. Um, anybody have anything on public safety? We'll just mention briefly in public safety because this is an issue which is bouncing around our neighborhood in East Silver Spring. Is that many people are complaining about the cars that are driving around without any mufflers or these tuned mufflers that are making um, lots of noise, you know, throughout the day, but especially at night. Um, uh, some civic associations are asking the Montgomery County Police Department, the County Council, and the executive to do something about that. Typically, the police would uh, stop a car and give them a repair order that uh, they would have to present to court to show that repairs had taken place. Apparently, from my conversations with MCPD, they believe that they're receiving mixed messages from the county council because one of the one of the tenets of the police accountability and transparency advocacy that we did over the course of the last year is that the county council the county executive have, have asked to reduce the interactions between the police and the public so the police have said that uh, they don't really want to stop cars for loud mufflers and i think they're trying to sort through that issue if that's a concern in your community, the noise of the cars, please raise your concerns with the uh, County Council and the Montgomery County Police Department so they know that it's an issue, not just on Sligo Creek Parkway and in Burtonsville, but throughout the county. May I comment on that, Alan? Sure. Um, there's, a, right now there's a rash of uh, thefts on um, Priuses at least, Toyota Priuses, of their catalytic converters because there are trace minerals in there that are worth more than gold. And thieves can jack up a car and cut it out uh, and be gone in less than a minute. I was tracked once at um, some caught on film and it was 47 seconds. And they tend to hit a neighborhood. We've had some in our own neighborhood here in North Four Corners. So when that's gone, the car is really loud. The muffler's gone. But so it's not, with the, without the catalytic converter anyway, the car is really loud. And right now, because there have been so many of these, I was told there's a six month wait to get them into the dealership to, to get it re, you know, replaced. So it's not necessarily somebody trying to have a noisy car. You just may, if you have to use your car every day and it, that's happened to you, then you don't have any choice. Some people are doing it by choice, removing their mufflers or using tune mufflers and they are quite obnoxious at three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, can I add one more thing to that? Sure, Carrie. I, I can't raise my hand for some reason. I, I don't know why. Um, there is a Facebook group that has been created by a, a resident in Alney, John Sang. It's called, uh, I think, the State Highway Safety Group. Uh, they've promoted a couple of bills in Annapolis that were that didn't make it to the floor. I would appreciate it. I think you all would appreciate it to go to my Facebook page and then go to the uh, State Highway Safety Group, join their group, make your comments because loud noises is part of them. They're they're primarily the only group is primarily concerned with the uh, motorcycle racing. Uh, along the ICC, it goes on to the middle of the night, no mufflers. It's terrible. They had a, a death, you know, one, one, one motorcycle rider killed himself by accident, in an accident, of course. So um, if you could do that, I'm sure they would appreciate it. They could use the support to trying to make our roads safer, our communities quieter. I think everybody would win. All right, that's all. Thank you, Carrie. Looks like Lewis has put information in the chat about the Maryland Safety Coalition. It was quick, but I think that's what it's called. So uh, we'll try to send some of that information around uh, to you. Um, we have uh, a public finance uh, committee and we've posted the press release from the County Council on what was in the, the FY20 FY22 operating and operating capital budgets that's on our website at the uh, our Facebook page uh, Montgomery Civic Federation 
on Facebook. Are there uh, any other announcements that people would like to make to the assembled group? Yeah, Alan, I'd like to um, just mention something about uh, a previous CTA that was introduced in 2019. It's a uh, 1907. Uh, that the Civic Federation testified against. It has to do with um, placing cell towers in the residential neighborhoods. And that has now advanced from the Fed Committee with very drastic changes uh, with language that wasn't even in the original uh, ZTA. So I just want to refer folks to one of our partners that's been working on this uh, Montgomery Coalition to Control Cell Towers. I'll put their website link in the chat if you wanna go there. They give a good summary of what the changes are. This will supposedly be coming in front of the full council uh, at the end of this month, although we're, we're not quite sure. We actually think it deserves a new hearing because there are so many changes in it. So just wanted to mention that. And I'll take any questions on it if anybody has any. Yes, Harriet, when you say there were drastic changes, changes for the worse or the better? Changes for the worse. Um, originally, the proposal was to have a setback of 60 feet from any dwelling. And now there is no minimum setback at all. Among other changes that are, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated. Uh, so... Period. Is this like the uh, the five G kind of towers, or is this the the big kind of towers, or something like that? The, this is on um, light poles and utility poles throughout your neighborhood. So, for every utility pole in your neighborhood, you could have antennas on it. That would be five G or any G. And yeah, there are I think a lot. That's probably, yeah. So there are a lot of uh, different concerns about that having to do with trees and right of way and just the distance from your house and things like that. So uh, I'm putting the link in the chat there. There's a lot of detailed information there. Also, you can refer to our webpage where we have our testimony from, actually there have been three ZTAs on this so far. So we've testified each time. Thank you, Harriet. Any other questions uh, for the good of the order? As we conclude, I just wanted to thank all the neighborhoods who have stepped up to make life during the pandemic uh, safer and more enjoyable. One of the things that I wanted to acknowledge right now is the creativity that neighborhoods have, have done to uh, bring food trucks to their neighborhoods. It's a new... Uh, it's a new activity. There are food trucks everywhere. Some communities like Sligo Brandview and Indian Spring and Silver Spring, East Silver Spring, um, North Hills, uh, the ones that pop to mind are uh, really doing extraordinary work bring, bringing their neighborhoods together via food. I know that's something that Delegate Charcutian would appreciate. Um, and uh, Charlotte Caulfield's uh, sister would appreciate that as, uh, as well. So keep doing Keep doing creative things, interesting things, and then share them with the share them with the group. Share them on Twitter. Share them on Facebook. Um, they're best practices for us, and uh, many of them will continue throughout the uh, you know post post pandemic. As mentioned before, our next meeting of the Civic Fed in person will be on the second Monday in September at the Executive Office Building in Rockville. It will be hybrid. Those of you who don't feel comfortable participating in person at that time, we uh, will have some kind of live stream Facebook thingy that we will use to uh, encourage participation. So does anybody have anything else for the good of the order? One thing. Yeah. I hope, I hope everyone has a wonderful summer. Y'all are wonderful people. You're fantastic people. You. You really put up the fight for, for the good of the order, as Alan would say. And uh, you know, we're still going to have to remain busy throughout the summer, but try to enjoy it. The pandemic is under control to, to a large extent. Have some fun. Nice. 
Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Alan, can I just ask one quick question? Sure, Joe. <laughs> so the, um, we talked about the session in July. So I, I guess, will we still get emails about that for the, um, the yes. session? Okay, so yeah, that'll keep on. And then the next official, our meeting is the second Monday in, uh, great, all set. Thank you. And that will be an election of officers on the agenda as well. Those of you who want to be officers or at large members of the executive committee, um, please let us let us know. Um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm assuming there's no abs abstentions in opposition. So thank you all and uh, see you in see you in September. Great job, Alan, all year. Thank you. Alan, thanks a lot, buddy. You did great, great job, Alan. Alan.